Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So today is a special presentation. Uh, it will not be on hydrology. It will be on uh, a method or methods that help to solve some hydrological problems. Okay, so it's about uh, a tool, uh, more about mathematical tool or concept that uh, allows to solve some problems. Uh, so if I make mistakes in presenting hydrological concepts, you could uh, whistle or you could say, ooh, something like this. And then I understand I'm making, I'm saying some stupid things. So, uh, so um, we uh, talk about data-driven methods uh, today. So <clears throat> this course uh, in our institute takes approximately uh, 12 uh, lectures. So uh, today I will try to squeeze it into only one and a half hours. So obviously we'll uh, have to omit many things uh, which could be important. But main principles I hope uh, you will be able uh, to gr uh, grasp. Uh, Data-driven methods are uh, used in many sciences uh, for centuries. It's simply empirical methods. Empiricism is studying uh, what you see around you, and that was done in hydrology and in water and in many other areas uh, for thousands of years. So people were observing what they see, they're finding some patterns in what they see, and they're making some conclusions and find relationships between different environmental variables. And then they would be writing some formulas, like some formulas presented yesterday are in fact data-driven formulas because they're based on uh, um, empirical evidence, on experience. Um, so we'll uh, talk about the notion of data-driven modeling. Uh, we'll talk a bit about data. And I will introduce uh, some of the methods. Uh, most important of them is artificial neural network and also M5 model tree. Uh, and then uh, I'll demonstrate some of the applications of these methods in uh, water-related uh, issues. And I'll talk a bit about hybrid models, where we could combine, actually, hydrological models or physically-based models with data-driven model, which leads to some advantages in terms of performance. So quick start, uh, uh, let's consider an example when we have rainfall or effective rainfall here and uh, uh, discharge. And we want to find relationship, uh, we want to f build a rainfall runoff model. The model that would describe uh, mapping from rainfall, maybe some other variables, temperature, and to, uh, to uh, runoff. So uh, one of the ways to do it, as we already uh, know from previous lectures, is to build lumped conceptual model, for example. We could also build distributed models, but let's uh, uh, keep it simple for today. Lumped conceptual model that uh, establishes a relationship based on some uh, simplified physical principles describing uh, water motion uh, in soil and overland. Okay? So it would map then rainfall, evapotranspiration, into uh, the runoff. And if we have snow melt and for evaporation, important is also to have temperature, but let's omit temperature for, for today. Another way of doing this is to build data-driven or regression model. So regression means actually a mathematical model that would, uh, given inputs which are numerical values or real values, would give you a numerical output. That's a regression, not necessarily linear. It could be nonlinear regression. So to say regression model is almost the same as to say data-driven model, but data-driven model is a wider concept. And then if we want to build such a model, we want to establish a relationship then uh, between uh, the discharge at next time step, or we could say in the end of the current time step, which is almost the same, and some uh, variables which we uh, have as input. And in this case, input is uh, effective rainfall, which is rainfall minus evapotranspiration, uh, and uh, discharge. But you see here, we use lagged values of uh, discharge and lagged values of rainfall. So uh, finding what is the optimal lag is one of the issues that we'll be solving in a second. 
Um, and also you can see that uh, these several uh, lagged uh, runoffs make this model very much autoregressive because it's safe to say that discharge next time step is the same as now, isn't it? You know, if you want to become good weather predictors, you always say tomorrow is the same weather as now. In Europe, in 75% of cases, you are accurate. So 75% accuracy is not bad, isn't it? So always say tomorrow is the same weather as now because it's autoregressive process. So uh, maybe it's not very fair to use this data because this model doesn't have this data as input, okay? So the, the uh, lumped model uh, has an input only rainfall and not Q. But we have secretly hidden some history here in soil moisture, which remembers what was happening in the past. So in fact, soil moisture represents some of these variables uh, which are like rainfalls because some of the water coming with rainfall is stored uh, in the states of the lumped model, okay? So that's a quick start. That's what we'll be uh, doing today. Okay, neural network tool, I will run it uh, uh, now and I will show you how it goes and then we'll return, it, uh, return to it uh, when you understand what uh, it is doing. So neural machine uh, was a tool which we started to develop. You remember on Monday I presented you the case when we used neural network to emulate the hydraulic slash hydrological model, NUM and Mike 11. And that was start of this tool, so we wrote first codes then because there were no codes for personal computers on neural networks in 1995. So they didn't exist. They, we had only German code for uh, workstations and we didn't have workstations. So, oh, where is my tool here? No, that's too complex. Look, I would, uh, sorry, I would change something here and I would do this, if you don't mind, because otherwise it's too complex for me. So I will now show you uh, the model run. Uh, which is a rainfall runoff model implemented as neural network and it will be now trained or calibrated using the data. So red line is model output. So there is an optimization loop running. Here you can see how many times. And gradually red line approaches green line. In fact, this is uh, iterative optimization or calibration process of the model. So currently you see in the scatter plot, like yesterday, uh, Svetlana, sorry, Zhenya uh, did uh, this. So you see, and what's happening now, uh, we have the optimization process going on. So we, we, we are not converging. We converged, but we're still looking for an optimum. <clears throat> Here optimization is done is in approximately 20 dimensional space. We have 20 parameters in this neural network. And we want to minimize root mean squared error uh, which is an error of the model with respect to the measured hydrograph, okay? So this is CEV catchment, uh, data from Italian colleagues of 1963, uh, hourly data for three months. It's 1,800 points we have. So, that's, so this is a neural network that we built. Now we could stop it. Okay, so this is training. Now let's verify the, uh, the system. So this verification, not perfect, but okay, not bad. Peak is very well reproduced, as you can see. This is data neural network has never seen. It's a new data. So it's verification, validation, or testing. It's all the same, okay? So now we can say, okay, so we model is not bad, so we could use it in operation. Here something is happening, so perhaps we didn't uh, do uh, calibration well. We could work on it. We do some iterations, but in the end, we'll arrive to, to a statistical model that establishes mapping from rainfall to runoff. So we have built statistical or data-driven uh, model of rainfall runoff process. Question is, do we, uh, ha have we used some physics in understanding? Question, answer is yes and no. So it's not uh, the laws of physics which are in this neural network. No, it's purely statistical model. But we used physics when we have been selecting the data. So all the physics went into 
uh, it's called IVS, input variable selection. So we're selecting inputs in such a way that it would represent the data. So this we will discuss in a minute uh, as well. Okay, so that was a quick start. <coughs> so I'll close this uh, for a second, uh, going back to presentation. Shift F5, because if I press F5, I go to the first slide, and Shift F5 brings me to the current slide. So it's maybe the most useful part in this lecture that you learned today, because it saves uh, a lot of time. During presentation, people press F5, and then they are embarrassed because they have to bring it up. So why uh, uh, there is a, quite a lot of interest during the last 15, maybe 20 years, uh, to data-driven modeling? Maybe 15. First, uh, we have a lot of measurements currently. We have a lot of automatic measuring devices uh, that measure quite a lot. Even if hydrometric network goes down in many countries, still uh, we, we have an urban environment. For example, we have a lot of measuring automatic devices in many other areas uh, as well. So there are important breakthroughs in computational intelligence and machine learning methods. and. <clears throat> this allows us uh, to uh, write simple codes to train uh, such models, and the people uh, now understand more and more uh, how these methods work. Also, it's part of education. That's uh, important. And then <clears throat> uh, we observe penetration of computer sciences into civil engineering. This is geoinformatics, hydroinformatics, well, bioinformatics into biology and so on. So this uh, sciences uh, pick up advances in computer science and artificial intelligence or computational intelligence, we should say, and use uh, successfully uh, these uh, technologies. So we, uh, if we look at hydroinformatic system, we uh, traditionally use physically based systems that uh, uh, collect data, this system collect data about the real world. These are physically based models, which are main type of models which is used, but more and more we're using data driven models. So for example, uh, examples are uh, Verbund, uh, this is a large Austrian company that builds hydropower dams. They use widely uh, neural networks to predict inflows into the reservoirs. It's an example where neural networks are used practically every day. Neural networks are used in the Netherlands to predict surge uh, in the North Sea because uh, sh ships uh, with a draft of 20 meters and depth is 21 meter. So they could easily hit the bottom when they enter Rotterdam Harbor. I showed you the picture, uh, storm surge barrier. There ships uh, go and depth is 20 meters or 21 meter. So you have to predict surge very uh, accurately. So they're running every uh, six hours a neural network together with meteorological models and try to predict what would be the, uh, during the tide sh uh, ships enter. Uh, to predict what would be the surge using data from uh, platforms in the open sea. And uh, so neural networks uh, are used quite widely. If you go around, in every tram that passes by, there is a neural network inside. This router here has a neural network inside because it first determines the noise on the line, and then it trains internal algorithms also for... Uh, uh, in your mobile phones, there are neural networks which are trained on your voice and so on. So. So these data-driven models or computational intelligence or machine learning models are around us. And now they're coming more and more into hydrological model. So as we discussed, model is a simplified uh, description of reality. <clears throat> and we want to use model to understand the studied system, to predict the future, and to use results of modeling for making decisions. Now, question is now, do data-driven models uh, allow you to understand the system? Well, some people say, yes, I don't believe in this. I think uh, physically based models allow you to understand the system much better. And data driven models uh, allow you to build up accurate mappings from one variable to another. But data driven models are quite stupid. So they're just doing what data is given to it and not more. However, some people say some neurons in neural networks represent some tanks in tank model. OK, maybe, but it's maybe too much. Now let's consider a simple example of a data-driven model. So a uh, question to you now, wake up, wake up. So this is the input X. I collected data and this is output. This could be rainfall, this could be flow or whatever. So uh, I collected how many? 11, I think. 
13 points, and I want to build a model. So don't look at formula because it's already there. Sorry, she shouldn't have been there. So what model will you build? Yes, yeah. Well, actually, the easiest is to build zero order model, which is a, a mean, right? It has no parameters. You just calculate mean. It's a zero order model. But uh, maybe uh, reasonable is to build first order model, which is linear regression here. So we'll build this model. You see, this is training process. You see, I spent some time to think how to represent training. So, oh, now it's trained, calibrated, it's the same. And now this line goes approximately through the point. So what was the uh, criterion of quality of this model? What is objective function when we optimized it? Yes, yeah, so we measure distances from the points to this green line. Okay, and we choose parameters A0, A1, such that uh, squared... Uh, sum of the square differences is minimum, right? So uh, it's possible to solve this problem because it's differentiable objective function. We can take derivative, solve this equation. Actually, it's not that easy because it's uh, not very well posed problem because number of parameters, uh, we have too many points here. We have 13 points and only two parameters. But okay, anyway, so it's solvable problem. And for example, in Excel, let me now do a trick and go to here. Uh, to sorry, sorry, presentations. I think it's open already. So this is another example of a, a data set of eight points, X and Y, and we built a regression line. Okay. Uh, is it the best model possible? Uh, nice model, actually. It's not bad, isn't it? It picks up the trend. But if you want to uh, build a more complex model, so in Excel, to my surprise, I found um, the way to build more complex models. So, for example, we could build logarithmic model. Look, see? Uh, it seems error of this model is lower. It's a bit more complex model. It's nonlinear model. Uh, we could build also polynomial model. Well, strangely enough, it goes in the middle. I expected it to go like this. Like, uh, who was it? was Andreas yesterday showed the paper. Ah, uh, yes, yes, that's true. Let's do it. Shift, uh, yes, that's true, okay. So you see, if you increase the power up to eight, it goes, I think. Oh, this is a more, uh, this is a better model. So if you look at the error, it goes, I suppose, down. No, it doesn't. So look, this is the model we like, isn't it? What is the error of this model? Uh, perhaps it's zero because, well, maybe close to, because six uh, is the power, and here we have eight points. So it's not uh, the splines, but OK, something else. Anyway, so uh, this error of this new model is zero. Is it a good model? We are aiming at models with zero error, isn't it? Sorry, again? Too much, yes. It's called uh, overfitting. So it fits the data so well that it becomes bad. Strangely enough, paradox. Model has zero error, but uh, we don't like it. Why we don't like it? Well, why? I mean, who cares? It's black box model, whatever is inside. But students maybe could answer why it is not a good model. What do we want from the model? That it describes the concept, the main principles. Main principle here is this line, trend line. Eh? The rest is, so what is this variation of uh, data around this line? Just perhaps noise. We don't want to represent noise. But this model represents noise. And even here, look what it does here. It's strange because this polynomial model, so he, it has to make this loop, and then it's completely crazy. Isn't it? So uh, the, uh, to wish <coughs> that the model uh, has zero error is not always right. Also for hydrological models, you may feed the data too well, and then it will not generalize well. What is generalization? We'll talk in a second. But in fact, if you assume that this data set is coming from the same distribution, 
imagine the same system, we observe yet another point. This point would come somewhere in this range around this trend line, isn't it? And this model would never be able to, uh, to pick it up because it goes too much through the, uh, it's overfitting. Its fit is too good. So conclusion from this is that we should not be aiming at building a model that has zero error. It's a paradoxical uh, statement, but this is a true statement. Why? Because we want to use this model not for this data, which is used for calibration or training, but for another set of data which comes into in the future. So let's discuss it more in a bit more detail now. Yes, so we'll discuss it in a, in a, in a, in a second. We'll return back to this because uh, повторение мать учения, so we'll... Uh, Repetition is mother of learning, uh, I said. Sorry, it was in Russian. Uh, so um, what uh, data do we use? Traditionally, we like data to be organized in a table. So uh, each measure, observation or, uh, yes, each observation we call often in machine learning instance or example. So it's example instantiation of a system when we measure it at a certain moment. And we have some inputs and outputs. These are attributes of, of the uh, of the particular system we're studying. So you have uh, this real data, but sometimes you don't have real data. You have uh, labeled data, you have classes. So machine learning also knows how to work with classes of data. For example, high, medium, low, or red, green, blue. If you work with LG, it may, may, may be color. So you could build up models that would use uh, inputs uh, non-real. But for today, we'll use only real data. So this is measured data in this table. Okay, it's all clear. Now model output <coughs> should come here as a time series often. In engineering very often we deal with time series. And then we want that this error between output measured in the past. So this is all past data, don't forget, past. We describe the past. And model output is minimum. So we, the problem of building this function f is called training. So we train the function in such a way that error here between uh, distance between these two time series is small. Often we use root mean squared error or absolute error or French school uses some sophistication like one divided by Q or square root of uh, Nash Sutcliffe or something like this. Okay, So uh, to give uh, stressing for the low flows because when number is high and you uh, error is high for high flows, you square it, you get even higher number. So you may uh, give too much weight for high flows. But, okay, that's another matter, so there are several things. Mm -hmm. So anyway, any model, not only data-driven, wants to generate predicted output, which is close to observed output. So our job is to build this machine learning model close to uh, modeled, uh, sorry, modeled uh, real system. So model should uh, resemble the real world. So again, I would like to remind that we had physically based models, data-driven models, and hybrid models, which is a combination of the two. We discussed this, so let's go on. Now let's look at, uh, again, a uh, rainfall runoff model. So you may have a catchment with the river and some tributaries and such like, and you have rainfall, which is uh, contributing to the flow over here. And again, we want to build a model that would link flow in the future next time step, maybe next several time steps back forward, because if this catchment is large, then rainfall happening here would result in, in changing uh, flow later. So there is some lag here, this T capital, and we want to build this model. So quetch, catchment is how to find these appropriate lags, which we already discussed, that we put uh, as input. So how to find these input variables. And second, how to build this nonlinear uh, function uh, F. So let's look now at steps in uh, modeling process. Uh, it's written for machine learning models, for data-driven models, but uh, you could also use it for any other model as well. So we, of course, first state the problem, evaluate data availability, specify the modeling methods and such like, and then only then we go to the building the model. And first important step, especially in machine learning, is to choose variables that reflect the physical process. When you build physically based model, you already sort of automatically know these variables. But data-driven models are built by computer scientists. They have often 
no idea what's happening in the nature, okay, because they never go out, they're sitting all the time in front of their computers. They even don't know there's nature and environment, so that's often the case. So we have to explain them what are these variables. So that's a role of hydrologists to work with computer scientists and to explain what actually we want to model. Then we collect, prepare data, or if you have a data, you maybe cannot collect more, then you have to prepare it in a certain form that would be eaten by data-driven models, and only then we build the model. So when we're building the model, we have to decide what is a good model. It means we choose the performance function, or this error, for example, what is the error that we want to minimize, and then we calibrate the model, uh, or in machine learning we say we train the model. Then we evaluate the model. We look at its uncertainty, sensitivity to parameters, and such like. Maybe we return back. You see the loops going back. And then we test the model using the unseen measured data. We'll discuss it in a second, how to do it. And then, of course, you apply the model. So these are steps. Uh, I'm dealing with uh, quite a number of papers in data-driven modeling. People are lazy to go through all the steps very often. They just take some data, throw it to the model, click a button, generate some nice plots, measure the error, good model, write a paper quickly, in bad English very often, and then submit. And then poor reviewers have to suffer and, and, and read. So, uh, so please follow all the steps in every modeling exercise. You have to explain what variables are in the model, what is the, how physics relates to the model. And I and didn't discuss here limitations. Every model or every approach has a limitation. Often people want to pre present forward the wonderful results they achieve, and they say, oh, a new word in science, but uh, not too often they talk about limitations. Every model is bad, but there are some which are useful, you know? So uh, limitations. And also evaluation of the models, that's an important thing. In natural sciences, often testing is not done. Strangely enough, in machine learning, if you submit a paper where a model is not tested or verified, it's rejected in 10 minutes. But we, we see many uh, papers where hydrological or hydraulic models are calibrated, and you can see nice hydrographs, but in fact, they are never tested with unseen measured data. Not all the papers, but quite a number of uh, studies. Maybe because there is not enough data, also possible, but then you have to say about it. It's also no problem. You have to just say there is a limitation. So we recommend in the first, next paper to look at uh, validation. Okay, so data-driven modeling is a term used uh, in uh, water resources often. So what uh, sciences or areas of engineering supply methods? These are the met uh, areas which supply the methods uh, for this. Statistics, machine learning, soft computing, including fuzzy systems, computational intelligence, which in fact all of it, artificial neural networks, which is one small component, one type of a model, data mining, often used term in financial services and uh, human resource management, such like. Okay, let's skip this. So machine learning. Again, machine learning is a machine that learns from data. It learns relationships between the variables, okay? We discussed this already. Now let's discuss again, uh, because repetition is mother of training, how should we arrange data that is used to train our statistical or data-driven models? Now, data should be uh, split into three parts. First, let's split it in two parts. So first part is used for training the model, and second part for testing the model. So testing, validation, and verification is the same thing. Just in different books, uh, they use different combination of terms. So when we build the model, we should not see the test data. This is secret data set, which is be kept, should be kept with decision maker, and which is ultimate test for your model. Okay? This data is used to train the model, and you can do with this data whatever you like. Now imagine you have here 2,000 points to build your model, and you know there is a 1,000 points, 1,000 observations, to uh, uh, test your model. But you don't know this data test, data set. You don't know what, what is in it. So what would you do? 
would you use all the data to train the model so that error is very small and then uh, pray give to the procurer uh, to the the person who wants this model uh, and then he or she will test it or what what do you do with your data so you have again here 2000 observations so 2000 records of rainfall and runoff in in case of a uh, lumped model that you want to build yes sorry again So yes, so uh, what you're saying that we can, should not use all the data for training. Actually, it's all here already on the trans uh, this slide. Indeed, we, we should not use all the data for training because we'll not have a possibility to test it before we give it for real test. We should preserve some data for secret testing by ourselves. Not secret, but testing by ourselves. So I have to split this data, with which we have, into two parts. One would be used for training, another one for uh, it's called cross-validation. So I like the term cross-validation for this, and this could be then co called testing. It could be called validation, but then it's a bit of confusion. So why don't we call this testing, which is ultimate test of the model? And this we call cross-validation. Why cross, we'll uh, talk about in a second. So again, whatever data you have, split it in two parts. Use one for, uh, for building the model, that's what I showed you. And then you test this model on this smaller data set, which you have at your disposal. Now, indeed, you say they should be statistically similar. So you could ensure that ranges are the same, means and standard deviations are similar. Often it's impossible to achieve, so, but you try. Okay? In hydrology, data is limited sets. In machine learning, sometimes we have millions of points, then you can do it. But in uh, hydrology, you don't have such, so much data. So you uh, at least try. So for example, you ensure that in training data, you have three peaks, and in test uh, cross-validation, you have two peaks of similar sizes, something like this. Okay, so you ensure that you cover floods and low flows uh, fairly. So that's the theory. Often, simply, you don't have enough data to follow the theory, but why not to start, think big, and start small? So this is how, if we want to start big. Now, I have shown you that uh, the model with zero error is not good. So what we should be aiming at? What model would be good then? Tell me. Don't read here because it's all here. So I would move back. So what model is good? How do, can we uh, ensure? When do we say the model is good? At what moment? This regression model we're building. How do we, uh, we judge the, the quality, quality of the model? Yes? yes? Maybe I'm going, but we just should watch to R square error. Maybe if it's like uh, more than, not error, just meaning of R square. If it's more than 0.8. <coughs> but on what data set? Uh, on data with more than 25 numbers. Of, so, so we have uh, 2,000 records of observations of rainfall and flow. Okay. So we could calculate this error using all 2,000 records because the model would run 2,000 times also. So we could com calculate error. This n in yesterday's formula on top, which is still, oh, it was here. I thought to leave it for you to connect to yesterday, but somebody cleaned up the desk. Thank you very much. Very clean now. But imagine uh, a root mean squared error or mean squared error. There is total number of terms to sum up. It's 2,000. Would you calculate error on 2,000 terms? Huh? With some Excel. Excel? Yeah, it's not the problem to calculate. No, it's not a problem, but I'm asking what would be this n when we look at the formula for error. How many observations should be included to calculate model quality? Split the sample. Huh? Sorry? Five years. Why five years? <laughs> you like five years. You're right. 
In hydrology, five years may be enough to... А? а, пятилетка, вот оно почему. Точно, Лев Самуилович, вы еще помните пятилетние планы, наш строек громадье. Здесь будет город-сад, да? It's a hydrologically maybe, there was five-year plan. So in Soviet Union there were five-year plans. So the lady says five years of data. It's enough to judge about hydrology of a catchment. Two and a half years. Two maybe not, but in four years, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's interesting, you heard about this, even in France, you heard about achievements of Soviet Union. So our propaganda worked very well, so that's, uh, oh, sorry, it's all on the record, so we have to be careful what we say. It's all record on the internet. So, so намного более длинно. Это потому, что вы профессор, и у вас много данных. А у молодежи, может быть, нет столько данных. Вот девушки говорят 5 лет всего. А у вас на вашей станции Шестаковка, у вас там 40 лет. Значит, 50. Плохая проверка. Вы абсолютно правы. Это сколько у вас данных есть, столько вы можете выжить из этих данных. Вы не можете придумать больше, чем у вас данные. Данные для вас все. У вас мира за пределами данных нет. Какой язык вы предлагаете? So, uh, indeed. Uh, so, okay, let's uh, talk about now not in years, but in data sets, because this is now easier. So, uh, actually, correct question to this, correct answer to this question is that the error, let me move to this slide, so please have a look. Ideally, we should aim at minimizing the cross-validation error. We have to try to minimize error on this imitation of a test set. Why? Because our person who pays us money for this model will do the same. They would take the test set and try to uh, uh, give you money inversely proportional to the error. If error is small, you get more money. That's why you use one divided by Q. Maybe that's, then it's directly in money, could be measured in euros. Quality of the model is measured in euros, okay? Anyway, so this set, cross-validation set, imitates the test set of a decision maker. Again, it's ideal situation, but let's first discuss ideal situation, okay? So that's why we want to aim at the model which is best on this cross-validation set, not on training set. Why? Because I showed you, training set, you can build a model like this. Model uh, error is zero, but it's useless model. Why? Because on cross-validation set, its error would be very high. And I'll demonstrate it uh, from a real example, actually. Now let's uh, discuss again. So what is a good model again? Uh, same example. We're building, now look, my optimization process, magic, magic, magic optimization happened secretly behind the screen. There is optimizer. So this line is a simple model, okay? Now we're not talking about uh, test set cross-validation, just let's look at it as training set and want to build a model which is good. So this is a good model, but I can show you the red model which is better. Red model. This is, model has two parameters. It's, it's in fact uh, a square function. A0 plus A1x plus A2x squared. Okay, so this is nonlinear model and its error is smaller now. And now I'm building fun uh, what I showed you before. I'm building this function, blue. It's the best model because its error is zero. I deliberately draw it through the points. Error is exactly zero. The best model in terms of error. It's the best. But if we want to test it, then if data comes close to green line, which is in fact the main process that we're modeling, the rest is noise then uh, error of the blue model would be high. So error of the blue model on cross-validation set would most probably be very high. So it's not a good model. So we have to evaluate the model on the error of the cross-validation set and not on the training set. So it's either this model or this. This is linear model, simple. Only two parameters. This is three parameters, uh, even better. So perhaps this is the good model because it has some non here, so that's what we have. So this uh, 
picture shows, and Andreas yesterday gave, gave a reference. I, I, I didn't know, actually, he, I didn't know he would present that slide. If you remember, there was a slide with, uh, where the models are also trained with, uh, with 20 parameter uh, statistical model, uh, which is not good. So <clears throat> then if we look at model complexity, which is number of parameters in the model, in this statistical model, and error. So if we increase model complexity, your error on the training set, it's called in sample in machine learning, would go down, down until it reaches zero. When we have many parameters, like eight or 10 or 20, you would have error close to zero. But if we take out of sample data set, it means cross validation set or test set, error would first go down, but then when we increase complexity of the model beyond reasonable limit, it would go up. It's theoretical plot, of course. It's always maybe have some peaks and uh, dips and so on. But this is more or less the theory which you have to have in mind when you're building any model, in fact. So maybe in distributed model, you can also say that, well, maybe it's not okay. I would not move to a physically based model. Let's uh, stay here with the statistical models. So this uh, picture I took from a book on pattern recognition. Sorry, I didn't put the reference. But what it shows is this. So first, don't look at lines. This is training, and this is cross-validation. The original data set is represented by these points. You see the points? This is original data set. We're training neural network model, which is non-linear statistical model. And we draw, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, we draw the line from the model. This is modeled data. And the dashed line, dashed line is unknown relationship between x and y. So this dashed line. So it's a secret process, natural process, which is behind. And, but when we measure, we have some noise or errors around it. So these measurements have some noise. But there is some sort of process which we don't know. If we would have known this process, we would draw this line and that's it, we're done. But we don't know this process. We know only the data from this process. So we have a trend, sort of. You can call it a trend. Maybe not a good word statistically, but it's a process which is behind the data. So in the end, what we want, we want a model that would follow the dashed line, isn't it? But we don't know the dashed line. So let's try to do something at least. So look, if when we start increasing complexity of the model, the next iteration of neural network gives you this model. You see, it goes closer to the points. So training uh, uh, error on training set goes down. But error on cross-validation set also goes down. You see, it was 0 0.92, 0 0.94. Now it's 0, 0.42, 0, 0.37, so it goes down as we increase complexity of the neural network model. Not only complexity, when we're uh, training it, calibrating. And then we get to the error 0, 0.13, 0, 0.15. You see the line on training set goes along the trend, but again, we don't know the trend. Imagine you don't see it. And then when we uh, run the neural network for 500 iterations, which is a lot, Error 0, 0, 002, you see neural network follows the data very well. But error on cross-validation set went up from 0, 0.15 to 0, 0.37. Yes? Uh, what does uh, cross uh, mean, exactly cross? Uh, or cross-validation and uh, validation uh, is uh, the same things? Same, yeah. yeah. Same. Just the term used, uh, actually I cannot explain why cross. cross. So yes. let's call validation. So it's uh, this, another. Uh, first set, uh, first phase of testing. So on this data set, as you see, error goes down, 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 and then up again. And here error goes down, 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 until it reaches almost zero. So this is in fact what is happening here. So error on training set goes down, down, until it goes to zero. And error on cross-validation set goes down, reaches some minimum, and go then goes up. So when is the moment to stop training or to fix the complexity of the model, it's this moment, here. Complexity of the model ideally should be here when your test set or cross-validation set shows, gives you minimum error. But note that error on training set is not minimum. 
So situation when your error on training set is very small is called overfitting because we go through every data point. So fit is so good, it's overfit. But it cannot generalize well. It means it cannot give you reasonable results <coughs> on data which it has never seen. So it's not smart enough to pick up patterns in the new data sets. That's the theory. That's maybe the most important component of data-driven modeling, which is very often overlooked by people who just start using neural networks. Yeah. Now, Lev Samuilovich, you say that uh, you use longer data sets for testing or cross-validation. That's great if you have this data. If you have 50 years of data and all this, yes. Then you have so much freedom to do things. It's, it's very nice. But we work with catchments in Africa and other countries where we have quite limited data sets. We have to do something. So we could use three years uh, for training and two years for validation, for example. But you in Europe have uh, much better than we in Russia. In Europe? In well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So in Europe, I'm not sure. 50 years, wow. Some catchments maybe. 15, 15, not 15. <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends. So more data you have, better models you build because you have the freedom. OK, so any questions here? The problem with, with the Europe and the Russian data is that often when you talk with Russian scientists and you want to decide of a, of, of a time period of extend the catchment, they say, let's take a period before 1956. At that time, the data were very good. I don't know what happened in the Soviet Union in, before 1986, but it seems that, that everybody, all the hydrometricians, were very uh, keen to do very good uh, work. Maybe they were scared of something. And after that, something happened. After, after the, the democracy came. came. Complete dis disorganization. Yes. yes. If you switch off the camera, I will explain. So. Yeah. Maybe in hydrology world something happened, but there were some political changes. If you know, uh, check that. You will learn a lot. Political changes. But uh, as you know, in societies with uh, very hierarchical structures. Many systems work well because uh, government is not counting on efficiency. It just allocates resources where it needs to be or it, w it thinks they should be. So it's concentration, such concentration of resources in certain areas that they become very well developed. In Soviet Union, it was fundamental science because it was important for some strategic programs, some space and nuclear. This is where, when science developed. Hydrology also was one of them in a way. Eh? Yeah. So. Uh, that's maybe one of the reasons. It wasn't that bad afterwards, because in 53, as you know, uh, there were some changes in the political system. In 56, even more changes. And then uh, people became free. But free, some people thought free means to work less uh, and to enjoy life more. And they're very right. Enjoying life more means doing less hydro hydrometric uh, measurements. <laughs> so, more modern. Yeah. Mo maybe more models, so <laughs> computer. Let's be in offices in Moscow, in nice big cities, then to go to the field and measure something. So a scientist asked uh, Kuchman how many people work in hydromet service, 100,000. <laughs> and in France, 2,000. It was in, uh, in the 70s, so a discussion with the foreign scientist. Yeah, so that's how it was. Uh, if you say, I, you are watching the time. Break, five minute break, on this positive note, that there were moments when 100,000 people were working in hydro okay, service. We have to continue, we don't have much time. How much time do I have uh, here, 11.15 only? 
So this course is the fif 15 lectures, I think, or 12. So it's a pity we don't have enough time. So, but I, I will try to, uh, uh, to, to run a bit faster because I want to show some examples also. Okay, what care uh, is needed in data-driven modeling? Look, care is this. No, first, no data, no models. Okay? If you don't have data, if data is bad, uh, you would be building a model of bad data. So it's a wrong model. It's a model of your ignorance, you can say. Okay? То есть, uh, sorry, yes, okay. То есть вы, если у нас данных нет, и модель не получится. It should be, it should be clear. So quality of data determines quality of the, of the model. Ideally, if you have all data about everything, you don't need physically based models because data is, is a pure representation of reality and model is not because model uses assumptions of Newton and whoever and maybe they were wrong. So all your equations have uh, already uh, errors. Numerical solutions have errors, of course, except uh, Professor Lee uh, in his numerical solutions of yesterday. It's perfect. So I mean bad models, of course. And Ecomark is also brilliant. And okay, whatever models use. But some models are not really accurately representing realities, numerical errors, a lot of uncertainties. So models already bring in uh, structural errors and so on. But data don't have it. So except measurement errors, which are not very high. So if you have a lot of data, it's, it's ideal way, but it's never the case, so it's ideal way. Okay, anyway, let's move on. I have to skip uh, types of data. I just want to say uh, there are data which are not only numerical, which is very often the case in hydrology, but also there are data which are ordinal order, low, medium, high flows, for example. So we could build models that would predict not the flows, but the interval of flow. You can, model would tell you, oh, flow tomorrow would be low, medium, or high. Or it will be flood, no flood. Such models are called classification models. We have no time to, to talk about them, but it's perhaps, these models are often more accurate than numerical models. Because numerical models are forced to give you accurate value for every given day or hour. And classification models are much more tolerant to small errors. So models which are tolerant to small errors could be more accurate because you don't ask too much from them. For decision makers, it's enough. If decision maker knows that model says flood tomorrow, it's enough. It's not terribly important how exactly it, it would represent this flood, you know, because he has to or she has to make a decision to evacuate or not or what to do. So in these cases, these cla classification models perhaps would be a better choice. Unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about them. Uh, so if you want to know more, come to our institute. In March, we're on short course of three weeks. Uh, OK, uh, data. We have to prepare the data in a certain sense. We have to skip this. Um, so one, just I want to show one. This is discharge. It's a real uh, case, discharge. And if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, a distribution of discharge, it's like this, okay? If we use Box-Cox transformation of discharge, we push it artificially to a bit more evenly distributed, to closer to normal distribution, so it's discharge, you know. You have a lot of low values, which are a bit useless, and not too many high values. But here you have, you see, artificially you amplified high values of discharge, and it's better for the model to have enough data in, d with in different intervals of magnitude. So that's a better data set than this one because it allows data-driven model to be trained better. So what we do, we, we transform the data by Box-Cox transformation, for example. Uh, where is it? Here. Uh, from this uh, to this, you see you, it, it has a bit more even distribution of values. Uh, then we train the model, okay? which would uh, reproduce uh, the calculate discharge. But when new data comes in, we also have to transform it, don't forget, because it was trained on transformed inputs, which have interval between minus two, two or minus two, four, and not between zero and 400, okay? So don't forget that new data should be also transformed. So, okay, anyway, data transformation, important component which allows to build more robust uh, data-driven models. Smoothening the data. Rainfall, Kolmogorov-Hurst, whatever, it's uh, quite a, 
uh, variable with high, very high variance in short, short periods of time. So for data-driven model, often you don't need such an accuracy of rainfall. Sometimes it's better to smoothen it, like it's done in economics, you know, smoothening of time series. There is a lot to do. We could use simple moving average or more weighted moving average was progressively giving lower weight to previous values and so on. Uh, Gaussian uh, filters to smoothen, uh, for example, rainfall time series. It, it allows you to build more robust uh, data-driven models because they would not be picking up these small changes in rainfall because catchment is a filter which leads to much smoother hydrograph. So rainfall is like this and hydrograph is very smooth. So why not to use this uh, understanding of catchment and to add additional component before the regression model, which would smoothen the rainfall into much smoother variable, and then you build much more robust uh, regression models. So this is where your understanding of physics of hydrology comes into data-driven models. So it's not black box model, as sometimes it's called in the, in the literature. I would say it's gray box, because enough knowledge is needed in order to build good models. So smoothening is important uh, thing. Okay. Uh, so there are models also built on uh, Fourier transform or wavelet analysis. So you could then, because it's a, if you have long time series, you can uh, either uh, feed the Fourier uh, harmonics instead of a time series. So you move into frequency domain or you use wavelets. Wavelet is a window-based Fourier analysis with the progressively diminishing weights given to the uh, uh, tails. So and wavelet analysis, there is... A, Adamowski in Canada, for example, he published papers where he shows that, in fact, instead of feeding time in time domain, if you feed components of wavelets, you get better models, rainfall runoff models. In Taiwan, I think also somebody is doing this. Yeah, so it's uh, quite a popular thing. Our student also did it, and indeed, uh, it could be a good idea, wavelets. So if you search wavelet neural networks, you would find enough papers on this. <coughs> now. What variables to choose to serve as input? We discussed that rainfall lagged are important inputs, but how many rainfalls you should take? What is this lag? So you can identify lag by visual inspection, maybe. You take, uh, uh, you take, no, this is correlation. Let me, just a second. So you take an event. So this is rainfall. You see this here, uh, dashed line, rainfall. We have maybe even a, a pointer. This is the rainfall. And the resulting runoff is this. So you can look at this lag. It's approximately five, six hours. If you look at several events, you would approximately identify lag. So your input, if you want to calculate Q at this moment, you need rainfall five hours back or six hours back. It's a small catchment. For bigger catchment, maybe three days back, right? So. Uh, this allows you to uh, select the variables as inputs to your regression model, which would be relevant, which would be optimal variables, in fact, to bring in. Uh, of course, uh, visual inspection is one thing, but you can use simply correlation analysis. So if you uh, calculate correlation coefficient between two time series, one is rainfall, another one is um, the runoff, and you start shifting rainfall backwards, you calculate correlation, you will find out correlation goes up, up, reaches 0, 0,5 with the lag of six hours somewhere here, okay? So correlation analysis, it's a simple way to identify uh, ideal lags in the rainfall, which you want to feed as input. Also, we use uh, average mutual information, which is a nonlinear way. It's a better way, in fact, to calculate correlation. It's not correlation, but its idea is the following, that we split intervals into bins, and we start counting how many <coughs> observations are falling into one bin. If uh, many observations fall or of two time series fall into one bin, it means they sort of uh, have the same information content, uh, and uh, this is what we use. It's called average mutual information, so if you search, you will find. Uh, here, advice is to search for uh, IVS, input variable selection, and papers of, uh, what's his name, uh, Galelli, Stefano Galelli. He's now in Singapore, was in uh, Politecnico Milano. So he published some papers, and he, they have a website 
where they collect information about this, IVS, Input Variable Selection, Stefano Galelli and uh, his colleagues. Yes? Why do you say that R square is better than the average user information? I didn't say better, no. So but is it uh, more robust? Or well, look, it's almost the same, because ideas are the same, uh, but, uh, well, correlation is linear, sort of. Pe people say linear, and average mutual information doesn't make any assumptions. It's just putting things together and calculating information. So how much information you get about time series B if you know A? That's an idea in, in mutual, mutual information. information. Without any linear information? Nothing. nothing, nothing. Just pure uh, having uh, time series and how much can you say about another time series. Yeah. So also, uh, what's his name? Uh, Shar Sharma in Adelaide in 1996, he published a paper on uh, partial mutual information. Nice paper. Check this Sharma. He's now professor in Adelaide or um, I've, uh, no, New South Wales, I think. Yeah, Sharma and co-authors, 96 and also later. Uh, partial mutual information, it's a variation of this and it seems it's a bit better, but okay, not much, not, doesn't matter much. Okay, classification. Look, colleagues, I, I think I have to skip it, but I want to tell you this. <coughs> Imagine you are solving classification problem. You have that many observations, rainfall runoff, and you say red points means flood, and blue points mean no flood, for example. Okay, well, it's wrong here, but okay, anyway. It should be like this, I suppose, but imagine this, okay? Now, we want to build a model now. Let me go back. So, we want to build a model that would tell you, for the new data, don't forget, for the new data, uh, is it flood or not? In this left case, it's easy. Linear model, training, training. Behind there is, yes, optimizer, you see. Now it's trained. Look, this model has zero error. It discriminates. It's called discriminating surface. It discriminates blue points from red points. Okay? So now, if new data comes in here, we compare it uh, to a green line and we say no flood. If point comes above, it's flood. Classification model. We don't need this data anymore. We can throw it away. And we stay only with one simple equation that would tell us flood or no flood in case you observe rainfall. Or, and other variables, okay? On, and flow yesterday, for example. Now, it's a bit more complex when we don't have linear discriminating service. Look, you cannot draw a line that would discriminate cases because it's a nonlinear case. You would see that boundary is something like this. But here, if we draw a line here, we have only one error here and two errors here. Okay, so it's a false classification red into blue and two blue points become red. False, but okay, on the many other points, uh, it's correct. So still would not be a bad, uh, good, bad model. But if you want to have a model which is absolutely accurate, which is not a good idea, we discussed this. But if you want, you can draw a, a surface like this. Uh, and this would be nonlinear discriminating surface, blue from red, also classification model. Principle of support vector machines, which was proposed by Vapnik in uh, Institute Problem Управления в 1965 году. Батюшки мои, вообще очень интересно. Он не в Майти, он да, ну в Америку поехал. Но ему не дали докторскую защитить по известным причинам в 1968 году. Так он что сделал? Он книгу опубликовал в ГДР. И защитил ее как книгу. Нет, Ему... Он был доктор. Да. Э, был доктор, но сначала не дали. И известно кто. Кто? Что? Не скажу. У меня есть его две книжки. Его пытались устроить в гидрометцентр. Ну, для того, чтобы распознавать опасные явления. Ну, уже был Указ, не брать. Да. В общем, общем э, мерзопакостное было время, прям скажем, в этом плане. Его руководитель уже там подал на отъезд. А, ну, в общем, были, были причины. причины. Но неважно. Короче, э, sorry, it's a story about support vector machines and Владимир Вапник. Yes, yes. No time, but idea there is this. It's a big margin models. Idea basically is this. Let's ignore small errors. 
So if error is a, is, a, is a certain margin, we ignore the error of a model. And we start counting errors only beyond these bounds. It's a very smart idea. And this will allow Dwapnik to develop a method in 1965, which is now recognized around the world, as the method that doesn't need verification. Yes, yes. He'll pose problems and stuff like this. OK. Pity we don't have time. Yes. Co yes? Question? No? Ah, OK. OK. Uh, I could uh, spend an hour talking about support vector machines, but it's a pity we cannot do it. So now, uh, yet another method is called uh, model tree. And the idea is this. We would, uh, sorry, where we are? Imagine you have a data set of two dimensional, x1, x2. They are both inputs. Now it's a different problem. And output looks at you. You want to build a model that would discriminate zeros from ones. Here there are zeros, there are ones. And look, there is one, uh, one here. Strangely, you see this? Strange, not outlier, but OK. Maybe nature behaves like this. So these are floods, and these are not floods, say. Okay? And x1, x2, some var environmental variables that you can measure, and then judge about floods. You want to build a classification model that tells you new data, if it comes here, would it be flood or not? If new data comes here, flood or not? Okay. So uh, we build something called decision tree. Very simple, maybe basic classification model that we could build. We first separate, try to separate all zeros from all ones. How do we do it? We look at entropy. Okay. We want to build subsets with the low entropy. It means that the majority of points in each subset belongs to the same class. That's how classification works, right? This is already a very good classifier, by the way. We say if x2 is below 2, then most probably it's 0. If it's above, most probably it's 1. With only one rule. So it's a rule-based system in a way. Only one rule already gives you a good classifier. If we go further, we again split this subset in such a way that entropy in this subset is maximum. And here, here entropy is 0, and here is not, but OK, also low. And this is based entropy-based division of subsets. Now your classifier is even better, but still you have here two points, which are 0 should be 1, and these two, also 1, should be 0. And then we continue building this classifier. And now this classifier has zero error on training set. Zero error. OK, overfits the data, but OK, why not? Let's build this. So now, if we know if we're in this quadrant with new data, it would be 1. And if we're here, it's also 1. On all other cases, it's 0. So it's a classifier. Very simple. Six rules only. And it allows reading environment to uh, say if it's flood or not. This is called decision tree. Why tree? Because if you represent it as, uh, as a tree, well, these are rules. You know, you look at very values and get the classifier. <clears throat> OK, uh, now I have to move on to neural networks. Otherwise, I will never show them to you. Sorry, we don't have, so we could. There are other models like M5 model trees. Uh, this we did for Hua River in China, by the way. One of the students, it was already, time flies, 12 years ago. So we, uh, it's uh, Huai He. He is the river. Huai River. You cannot say Huai He River because it will be Huai River River. So this is a very large catchment. And the student brought data. And we managed to build a model like this, a neural network model and model 3 model that would uh, predict the future values of flow at this point, knowing rainfall here. Okay? If you want to see the paper, it's published in 2003 in uh, Journal of Hydrological Engineering about this case. So these are linear models which are built. It's a piecewise linear models, not neural networks, not nonlinear, but it's piecewise linear. So for some areas of parameter space, it's linear, then again linear, again linear. So it's a complex of linear models, but it forms the nonlinear model overall. 
So we could show that it works, so M5 model trees, and you can see that uh, M5 model and neural network observed modeled neural network model metal tree, so it's not bad. It could reproduce this uh, Q. Okay, th those were initial experiments with uh, these models. It was some time ago already. Right, colleagues, I have to switch now to the next presentation, which will be about neural networks. So, this is the neural network. Okay, we'll use this one. So, we have several inputs, numerical inputs, and interestingly enough, in this model, we have several outputs. Often, we use only one, but you can use several. So, complex neural networks, you can train neural networks to reproduce several output variables. Uh, for rainfall runoff models, we use only one very often, typically. Now, what happens... Here. So these are inputs. This nothing happens here, just distribution nodes. So signals, these values x1, xn, these are number of inputs, are sent to green uh, nodes. Inside the node, you have very simple thing. First, you have linear regression model, pure linear regression. You see it's a linear combination of inputs here, right? Pure linear regression. And f, capital F, is this sigmoid function. Note that it's linear here, almost linear in fact, but it squashes uh, the range of output of this linear regression between 0 and 1. And here it's quite nonlinear. So this model, in fact, this is the formula, it's very often seen in nature. Something develops slowly, slowly, then fast, 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 and then saturation comes, you know. And sometimes it dies, but not here. So this is a function which, in fact, its property is that it's differentiable easily, fast. If it's differentiable, you can imagine, it can be used in gradient-based search in the models. That's why, actually, this function is used. Or hyperbolic ta tangent is used. It's a similar function, but with, with, with minus 1 and 1. So that's it. So this is what happens in this node. But there are many of these nodes. So this way, a complete mess comes in. So if it would be one node, would have here nonlinear function, this, with a linear combination of inputs plus nonlinear component. And then it would go to output. Imagine you have one output, and that's it. So you can build a neural network like this with only one middle node. It's called hidden node. But there are several. So you see that this node gets exactly the same inputs here. But coefficients A are different. F is the same everywhere, everywhere. At least this is the same. So it, it, it helps a bit. Okay? So then you see in the second node, all these inputs come in with different weights. So all these pink lines have weights written on top of them. Weights are A. And then it also sends output to this. Imagine you have only one output. So it also sends output here. And what happens in this node? Same thing, linear regression plus f. But weights are different, b. So if you wouldn't have nonlinear components here and here, it would be purely a linear regression model because linear, then linear, you combine weights, and in the end you will have here output, which is a linear combination of inputs. But since we have nonlinear components, uh, life becomes much more complex. So overall, it's a nonlinear regression model. Why it's called neural network? Because people in the 40s, when first computers started to appear, they thought, mm, why don't we build a computer that would resemble human brain? And human brain are neurons which work in a similar fashion, you know? So Neurons receive some signals, they are summed up. When it's above threshold, they fire, and they send signal to another neuron. And these neurons com combine information coming from everywhere. And a chemical and electrical process here, here happening. So this whole thing 
brain is a set of neurons. So uh, dream there was that why don't we build computer simple neurons that would be connected. And since brain can learn, our neural network, artificial neural network, would also be able to learn. Good idea. But how to implement? Well, linear regression plus nonlinear. OK, fine. Not bad as well. But it's very far from the brain. First of all, we have 4 billion cells. Second uh, problem is that these connections change every second many times. And in artificial neural networks, it's fixed. There are networks that change, but we're very far from building artificial model of a brain. Still, ideas were picked up, and those souls also it sells well. If you come to somebody and says, I want to develop for you nonlinear statistical model, ah, okay, statistical statisticians go away because there is lie, big lie, and statistics. So we know, go. But if you come and say, I want to develop uh, an artificial neural network model, oh, they say, very clever. Or if you say machine learning model, ooh, machines learn, ooh. So such project could be 10 times bigger than statistical project. That was a bit of driving force, I'm afraid, in the 50s and 60s, and especially in the 80s when uh, first uh, Verbos uh, wrote his PhD in uh, uh, Harvard in 1974, where he has shown how you can train neural networks. Nobody read it. But uh, I could not say nobody because he sent this, he was giving a lecture later, and he said, I sent my PhD thesis to a couple of people, and nine years later they published a lot about this, never referring to my PhD thesis. And he was telling this in a uh, joint uh, artificial, neuro, uh, sorry, yes, artificial neural network conference. Regularly he's speaking, giving this talk to thousands of people, actually, well, 2,000 people, big conferences. Uh, uh, lesson to you. If you have good result, publish it as soon as possible. Some people know how to do it, and some people still uh, have to learn uh, how to publish. Don't leave it in PhD, because it's not a publication. And uh, people read papers and not books nowadays. Anyway, returning back to the neural network. So question to you now is, this is nonlinear statistical model. Uh, Almost linear, but because of f, it becomes nonlinear, right? How many parameters do we have here? So in linear regression model, we have two parameters in si simple linear. In multi multiple linear regression model, imagine it's a multiple linear regression model, multiple, multiple linear regression, multiple regression model. Uh, how many parameters would have? If you have n inputs, how many parameters? <laughs> No, no, it's, it's a, a single, but you, you have, have many inputs. Two, two times n. Why two? Because two weights. n minus two. But it depends on the layer. No, forget about this. If you have linear model, how many parameters do we have? n inputs. Huh? Excellent. Yes, n plus one. Because there is free term, so it's a0 plus a1 x1 plus a2 x2 plus ta -ta -ta, a n x n n plus one weights we call them weights or para or coefficients okay how long must be sales? sorry how long must be sales to use size, size of data set mm -hmm. uh, let's discuss it in a second i'll answer this question yes it should be big important. yes it's very important because if you have a data set of uh, of five points and you want to train 10 parameters, ill pose problem. So, uh, you know, but still you can build a model, but it would not be robust. It but could be anything. There isn't some, uh, golden rule, no. Golden rule is uh, more data. That's golden rule, you know. So, anyway, but if you have nonlinear model, number of parameters here is number of colored lines. Okay? So it's n by n hid by uh, n output. So total is very high, actually. So in the end, let me skip this. I will come to this. In the end, we will be optimizing this function. Look, this is input. You remember linear model and input f. This is g is that f, it's the same function. And then b, because it's hidden layer, and then output. So this is 
the objective function, sorry, this is the uh, uh, nonlinear regression model used in the neural network, written down analytically. It's analytical model. Nice thing. And it's differentiable. Why? Because G is differentiable and linear functions also differentiable. So we can find gradient in the space of parameters. So how many parameters you have? You have many A's and many B's to find. So it's optimization problem. So you want to minimize error here, minimize error. This is measured, this is calculated. This is squared error, and you want to minimize it. That's it. Yes? yes. This is a mathematical question. Yeah? Uh, when you say that the, the, we can compute gradients, it's differentiable, does it, it need that the surface, response surface, will be smooth? Yes. Does, uh, it need, does it also mean that there are no... Um, local minima. Local minima. Yeah. Uh, so surfaces are extremely complex. It's a multidimensional space. Surfaces are very complex. There are many, many multiple minima. And neural networks are often stuck, are stuck in multiple minim in uh, local minima. So that's why in my tool I have a button called shake. You click on it and you add random weights so it jumps out of local minimum somewhere else and then you continue gradient search. So in fact, neural networks are trained by, uh, so training is solving a nonlinear optimization problem. Uh, by the way, uh, non-constrained, which is nice. Uh, uh, and you find gradient, and of, co of course, if you read, uh, so there is a pure gradient search, a new set of weights, A and B. This is vector of weights. At the next iteration, N plus 1, it's weights at the previous iteration, so it's a point in n-dimensional space, in high-dimensional space. Uh, and we make a step in the direction of the gradient. This is the gradient uh, of the error of the neural network. And it can be calculated analytically. That's the beauty of it. Now, again, it has multiple minima, so we may move towards the minimum very nicely, but it could be local. So there are additional components on it, uh, genetic algorithms or randomized search or multiple starts from different random points. We want to arrive to a global minimum, and this would be a minimum for the error and hence the good network. Okay? And actually... Uh, this is called delta rule by Widrow and Hoff. Why it's called delta, I don't know, because it's pure uh, rule in nonlinear optimization. And Widrow, of course, knew about this. But it's, I think, as an example, when scientists, just to promote their wonderful idea, rename all thing with a new one, and then become famous. So that's how Widrow became famous. And, uh, but he's a great scientist, without any doubt. And at the conference, for example, he was demonstrating how he trained a truck with the cockpit precept, uh, what you attach to the truck, next truck, uh, and you pull it. How would you call it? Additional trolley. trolley? Yes. So imagine you have a truck, and driver has to move backwards in the warehouse with the trolley behind. Extremely difficult problem. And he has shown how in the uh, yard court of MIT, he trained the truck uh, by trial and error neural network. He trained neural network to move the truck backwards without any problem. So it's small gates, truck moves with the trolley backwards, you know, trolley goes like this and then into the, into the warehouse. Wonderful movie, find it on internet. Hoff, uh, Widrow uh, shows this with his student, very nice. So all these uh, interesting things. So, <clears throat> okay, there is problems of network paralysis uh, and many other problems of in network training. Um, there is a nice, I like uh, this one, a variation of neural network, which is called optimal brain damage. What does it mean? So, you know, people invent things, you know, so like simulated annealing, you know, or uh, ant colony optimization and optimal brain damage. So what is optimal brain damage? In optimal brain damage, we want to reduce number of weights. So we want to remove some of the weights in the neural network here. Uh, maybe they're not needed. We just remove them in a such a way that neural network wouldn't suffer and still it would be more robust because you have less parameters to train. Yes? yes? So, uh, I really like your presentation. I want you to become famous. Oh, oh please, yes. Oh. Can I suggest that the work you can you shake your neural network? Yes. yes. You don't say I shake it. You say I give him a shot of vodka. Because <laughs> in the brain, sometimes it's more shot, but it's limited quantity. French are speaking, huh? <laughs> <laughs> And get you out of, if 
you are stuck in, uh, in your thoughts, yes. you just get out of it. That's, That's right. I didn't know. Now I, at my work, I will use it more and more often. <laughs> yes, thank you. When I'm stuck with my ideas and I don't know what to do. Yes, that's true. Good idea. But I would suggest to slightly, uh, slightly update your proposal. Let's use Armenian cognac. It's even better. Oh, I see. So, okay. Optimal brain damage. Yes. So some of the connections would be switched off, and then it's more robust. You know, less parameters, better the model. It would less overfit because you have, if you have many more para many parameters, you may overfit, reduce number of parameters, brain uh, damage your brain, and you become better. Uh, look, I'm running out of time. Let me show you uh, how do we train net neural networks for a simple case. So simple case is this. We have input and output is sine function. I generated artificial set, which is sine of x, and second output is cosine of x. So neural network has one input, x, and two outputs, sine of x and cosine of x. But neural network doesn't know about this, how I generated this data. I generated it and threw away the program that did it for me, and I left only the data set. Okay? Now let's have a look how it works, if I find it now, because I forgot where it was. And then to show, and then to run. No, oh, it's not here. Yeah, sine, cosine. So, uh, data here is, so, uh, this is the uh, output data depending on x. It was generated by secret process, which is called sine of x, as you know. And this is second, uh, and this is second one, which is cosine of x, okay? Right? So, but neural network does know about this again. It just receives a data set of 315 points. And uh, its job is to build, uh, to find the weights. Number of weights, I will show you how many. It's uh, 20 something. Such that output of a neural network is close to this data. Statistical model. We're building pure statistical model. So let's uh, do it. And uh, first, I want, to, uh, I want to set the model. So number of hidden nodes. You, you remember hidden nodes, how many nodes? So we have one input only, very simple. One input, two outputs. One input, two outputs. So we would then put first one hidden node, only one, mm -hmm. and see what happens. So I'm saying here one hidden node. You see number of hidden nodes. Train the model, and let's try to train. So it's trained, actually. So does it resemble something for you, this red line? It's this sigmoid function. It's a function of the output. Cannot do more because it's only one hidden node. And we're looking at one output. So it's that output which shows uh, this result. So for x, it tries to resemble the data, which is time series 300 points. This is the data, maybe it's your flow, whatever. But it cannot do much more because it's only one hidden node. So the model is too simple. So let's look at the structure of this model. Lot. This is this model. So how many parameters does this model have? It has one, two, three, four, five, six parameters. So it's a six parameter model, still too simple. It cannot reproduce this wave actually well. Okay. Okay. So, but one simple model, isn't it? So as simple uh, as possible, but not simpler. So let's uh, then. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, train. We stop. We now set the model. We add second node. Now this model has two uh, hidden nodes, green ones. And this is free term. It's that uh, B0, yeah? B0. And this is A0. You see, input is one input only, blue one. And black one is not an input. Maybe not a very good uh, display. But black is this A0. So A01, A02. And this is B01, B02, because there are two outputs. Okay. So we're training now the uh, solving optimization problem. 
in what is the dimension of the space we're solving. We have to find these weights. Uh, it's uh, 4 here and uh, 3 by 2, 6 here, 10. 10 dimensional space. So in 10 dimensional space, we start with a random point, which is random values of weights, and start moving using gradient descent because we can calculate gradient. So it's a pure gradient descent towards the minimum. This problem is quite simple, so it's quite smooth. There are no local minima actually here. I don't, I don't think so. We don't know. But so let's train the network now. Yes. yes. You don't have unique solution in this case. Uh, no, there, there is a unique solution. Uh, unique solution? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, seven parameters. Yeah. 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 Unique, unique solution, solution in, 20 20 in uh, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 dimensional space. space. Yeah. It's, it's not, not a new point. Both problem. It's a unique, unique solution. solution. In, in terms of one error. So if we, if we say this is the, our objective function, yes, we can find the point which gives minimum to this objective function. So there is no other set of parameters that gives a lower value of objective function. And it's like this. So it's not flat. It's, it's curved. So let's train. Let's see. Ah, look, look, look. It goes, goes. Now, now, now it searches in this space. Maybe there are local minimum. I think that it is stuck in the local minimum now, actually. But it's better than before. Let's use shake button. So by, by shake, we add 10% of weight to each weight. Sorry? Cognac now. Armenian cognac. Ararat. Achtamar. Achtamar is a good one. Yeah. Okay, Achtamar. Oops. Look, look, look. Please, please, move, 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 move. So error goes down, down. Oh, you see? Look. So why, what is happening? We, because we use uh, we, uh, steps which are not optimal, we're trying to move. Ah. Huh? Anyway, but error is not bad, so it's quite low error, but not an ideal model, but okay, that's what we have. We cannot get better. Let's shake again. Yeah, okay, not ideal. Let's stop. And now let's add the third uh, <coughs> hidden node. If we plot, it's like this now. We have how many? 2 by uh, 3, 6, plus 4 by 2, 8, 14 parameter space, 14 weights to train. Okay. Oh, look at this. Huh? At the Pobeda. Pobeda Znani in Miravoy Reaction. So we have very good model now, isn't it? So it's enough to have three hidden nodes. If we put the fourth node, it would be ideal fit, practically ideal fit. Very low error. Okay? So that's a neural network. Stop. Now let me show you the model, which is uh, okay. Radial-based function networks. I will not talk about them. This is yet another. Let me show you. Italy, Italia, Tuscany, Arno River Basin. Famous river, so much data done. Many Italian PhD students did their PhD there and many people. Anyway, so it's a, a cradle of civilization, at least in its modern form. It's where Renaissance happened in the cities around this river, in this river basin and so on. There is a sea of a catchment, uh, which is small, this catchment. And we have data of the sea of a catchment. We want to build a model that would relate rainfall and runoff. Rainfall runoff model. We have around 2,000 observations in three months, hourly data. Okay? Thank you, uh, uh, Marco Franchini, who gave me this uh, set some time ago. So this we discussed. We find by correlation analysis the best possible inputs. And we build, uh, we tested several models. You see we used moving average of rainfalls here. We used pure values of rainfall of several time steps. So different models. And we accepted several models to predict flow 
one hour ahead, three hours ahead, and six hours ahead. Okay? So uh, these are the results. This is one hour ahead, very accurate. Three hours ahead, well, okay, more, uh, neural network is red. A bit less accurate, but very good, right? And six hours ahead, okay, there are strange things happening here. Uh, but here, not bad. Here, a bit strange, but okay, quite good results. So these are neural networks uh, trained, and structure of the neural network is on top. Look, this neural network has only one rainfall now of now and one flow of now. Output is flow six hours ahead. Why can it predict flow six hours ahead with the time horizon six hours? Because travel time of this rainfall RT is six hours approximately on average. It could be one, it could be ten, but on average it's six. So on average, neural network is not bad. Why here it's wrong? Because maybe rainfall happened very close to the outlet of the catchment, so it didn't pick it up, of course. The water was gone. Travel time is, sh uh, is short. When it's happening close to the observation point, water is gone. Okay, so if we uh, go to the neural network, uh, where is it? Oh, sorry. No. Uh, just a second. Uh, I, See catchment. I'm using uh, the model of six inputs, so not uh, uh, so six a bit less inputs, but uh, structure the same. So train the model. Let's see. So green line is the hydrograph which is measured, and now as you see, neural network is being trained. So number of iterations is shown here. So error on cross validation error goes down, down. You, we could zoom in and, and see it, and error is already small, and you see. Why it is happening like this? Because in the multiple dimensional space, here dimension is uh, 40 something. Let me check in a second. So we jump over the minimum, we jump back. We jump over the minimum, we jump back. So this optimization process is not converging well. So because my algorithm is not very well designed. So I used the book of Smith of 1993 when I coded this. And uh, it, it's quite simple uh, gradient based search based on momentum. So it's not very sophisticated. Nowadays, you take MATLAB codes, Python codes, all implemented, very sophisticated, levenberg markward optimization algorithm, works very well, reliable, and now it's no problem. So to build neural network, you don't need much time. OK? So, and as I have shown, if we stop at a certain moment, OK, and we verify, so this verification, which is a bit underestimation on some points, but not that bad. Colleagues, I have to finish. Could you give me three minutes more? Uh, because I want to show you uh, advanced stuff very quickly. No, sorry. I know you're all tired, but let me show you. Uh, the following. Let me show you this. <clears throat> this is a hybrid model. So forget about this thing for a second. We have hydrological normal physically based model, which uh, make forecasts or calculation, maybe not into the future, if you have forecasts of uh, hydrological load, precipitation forecast, then generate forecast. But typically, it's just model output. Uh, and we traditionally use this model output of a normal hydrological model. Okay physically based, lumped or distributed. What we can do is this. We run this model for the past five years or 17 years or how many years. And every time we calculate error and we save it into a data set. For this error, we also save on the same line in this file the inputs, outputs, and what is not shown, unfortunately, here, but in another presentation it's shown, soil moisture. You can take soil moisture from the model, which gives you a bit of memory of the physics, and also save it. And then we have a data set 
with the inputs of rainfall, uh, runoff, soil moisture maybe if you want, and output is the error. So we have a matrix of data and we can build neural network model or data-driven model that would predict value of the error. Given inputs and errors and uh, soil moisture, it would tell us what is the error for a similar situation for this particular uh, event or hydrological state uh, of the catchment. This model is complementary model. It's a neural network or regression model. And it could be used together with this one. Now what happens in operation? In operation, we feed input data to hydrological model. We generate flow, stream flow, and we can use it. But additionally, we can run complementary model, generate the value of the error, its assessment of the error. Okay? We subtract error from the value of the model, and we generate improved output. This is called error character. In meteorology, sometimes it's called bias character. But uh, I think better, because bias is fixed uh, difference between model and observation. But here, this model is dynamic. So every time, error is different, depending on state of the catchment. This works very well. Actually, it corrects a lot of errors in hydrological model. So, uh, and uh, in a way, it's a neural network of this system because so much knowledge is over here uh, already. That's one idea, which is used quite well, and most of our students actually use error characters on top of lumped conceptual models. Okay? Second idea, if I may, which is, uh, uh, I think, even more interesting, is this. And I presented in Hydromet, uh, but unfortunately not here. We have model uh, uncertainties, right? You remember. Now, what we say that this is the actual, we don't know it. We measure it. We have this point, at this point T, we measure flow or whatever. And this is the model. Okay? Even if model is optimal, well calibrated and all this, good model, still it has an error. Every time step, there is an error. Now we make important statement. We say that the error is the manifestation of uncertainty. So we ignore distributions of inputs, distribution of parameters, all this. We say our model is optimal uh, model, single model, no ensembles, no Monte Carlo. Forget Monte Carlo for a second. No, not yet. No, we don't use uh, real-time data. We, we say... In a way, yes, but let me uh, get to this. So model and measured are different, and this error is manifestation of uncertainty. Okay, that's first thing. Okay, Monte Carlo will skip because uh, it's another thing. And what we do, let me, sorry. So when I just explained to you, we have error character here, right? Neural network uh, error character, but... In this approach, which is published in Water Resource Research 2009 with Shrestha and Neural Networks Journal also earlier, what we do is this. This model will not uh, forecast the error itself. This model will forecast the quantiles. Sorry, sorry. this is the essence of the method. Too many steps. No, it's not there. So this model would forecast the uh, quantiles of the error PDF, okay? So uh, we would, uh, f this is inputs, this is error. We could construct distributions of errors using the past data. We calculate quantiles, we put them into a table, and our neural network would predict quantiles of the error. So, in fact, it predicts PDF. If we have 10 neural networks, it would predict 10 quantiles of the error distribution, and we could draw the error distribution, and please be aware, for every time step, it's different. It's not what Todini does and calculates overall distribution of error, predictive uncertainty, having everything in one bucket and shaking it. No, we do it for every time step. 
So for every time step, neural network would predict uh, the two quantiles of error. And hence, instead of giving only one model output, we say model output this plus prediction interval. For every time step is different. So this method is called unique, stands for UNESCO IHE and EC, European Commission that paid for the research. And in the end, if new record comes in, we could calculate <coughs> quantiles of the error for that particular point. So that's <coughs> use of data-driven model together with hydrological model, plus predicting uncertainty. So I think it's quite interesting result. If you want to know more, we have codes to give uh, to, uh, for you. To, if you want to test it on other cases, you're very welcome. Colleagues, with this I have to finish. Yes, I, I see the sparkles coming from uh, several of size. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> questions? W where is the coffee, the question, yes? When other questions? So, yes? If, if you apply the neural network, for example, to glacial air basin, what do you do? Is it other inputs? Or where you have glacial? You have water from glacial? Neural networks are stupid devices, you know, it's just yeah, machine. Yeah, other inputs, or what do you do? Other inputs, of course. What do you do in your physically based models? No, there is a special algorithm for that. For what? No, special. But, so, uh, special, uh, what do they produce? They produce the uh, generation of water flow from glaciers, yeah. depending on season, temperature, and all this, right? So if you have this data, you have, it's, it would be one of your input variables, correct? Yeah. So <coughs> your algorithms would generate these water flows, or maybe even more. You can build up a neural network instead of these algorithms, I'm not sure. But if you talk about pure rainfall runoff, or I would say input-output relationship, use this data, feed it into neural network, and it can be treated in the same fashion as uh, rainfall. So neural network doesn't care about what inputs are fed into it. Yeah. So it's just a tool, yes? What about, what about the contribution of different sources of uncertainty? Is it possible to estimate contribution, for example, contribution of uh, model structure? I mean, it's a very important question because we can estimate the contribution of parameter of sort of uncertainty. Yes, Professor Kresa. Of course, about the input and error of the measurement, but what about model structure? Uh, yeah. Yes, so uh, there are different sorts of uncertainty, of course. So, but uh, Dr. Kresanova presented. She said only about uh, climatic model uncertainty. We, we know about this climatic model. She yeah. said us about this uncertainty. Right. right. So, uh, look, if you want to uh, distinguish between so different sources of uncertainty in the output signal, it's a tricky business because you don't know where it's coming from. Now, uh, I think Kuchera with Dmitry Kavetsky and others, they published some papers where they bottom, what is it called? Bottom yeah. this, all these methods that in fact make a step towards this direction. Yes, but <coughs> uh, here uh, you talk about structural uncertainty. Now, here there is uh, uncertainty uh, uh, which, is, which relates to the inadequate, that model is inadequate. You can say it's structural uncertainty or what we can do, and the, there were also papers about this in FLEX, in TU Delft, and in Australia they call it uh, fusion, no, fuse of uh, Clark. So the idea there is this, that you have here two tanks, but you can generate hundreds of models of different tanks. Mm -hmm. By this, you, you, you have hundreds of different models, or so 10, and in a way, if you study uncertainty, which relates to changes in the model structure, you can talk about contribution of structural uncertainty towards the total uncertainty uh, in the output uh, here. So you can study this. I remember the recent uh, paper of Wapnick, he uh, tried to estimate uh, optimal, optimal uh, structure of model for, uh, for specific data. Optimal. Right. right. Good, interesting point. I think you can do it, but then uh, what about uncertainty? If it's optimal, it's another thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's true. When we say optimal, 
we sort of remove uncertainty already because we made a decision about the structure. Probability of that model is one. Yeah, right. But it's also interesting thing. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yes, yes. So idea is that uh, we have uh, hundreds of different data-driven methods. Neural networks and support vector machines and uh, random forests and, uh, and so on. So which one to use for a particular case? There is no free lunch, uh, free lunch theorem, you know. So there is no model that is best for every data set. For every data set, there is a model which is best. But we don't know it in advance. So in a way, we have to try them all and then choose the one. But if we uh, bring new data, maybe another model is best. So that's... Uh, um, physically based model is the best and ECOMAC is the best yes no problem with that but again physically based model is the right thing to do because it uh, encapsulate the knowledge about physics and chemistry and all this stuff and biology yes, yes. Uh, I, I have a lot of respect for um, neural networks and especially in, in France, we, we are using them to correct the deterministic model, mm. uh, like you, you explained, and it, the, the great success. But I just want to make a remark, because it took me, but when I discovered neural networks, it took me maybe a long time to understand that they are not exactly the same as usual uh, let's say conceptual or physically based model. They they serve no other purpose. And in fact, we cannot we, and we, we cannot use them exactly the same way because, in my opinion, they cannot simulate flow or simulate the error. They can only forecast it. And in fact, you mentioned in your presentation each time that you were presenting results, you were saying with that much advance or with that much lead time. And in fact, for me as a hydrologist, it's a forecasting problem with, for example, and with a very useful forecasting problem. But for example, if I wanted to simulate something for 2050 or 2000, uh, climate change impact, I, in my opinion, I wouldn't be able to use neural networks because the last discharges that are needed for the neural network system and just not available, they did not occur yet. Is, is it a, let's say, limited view in your opinion? Or? No, it's not limited view, you are very right. So if you have no, uh, uh, if, uh, first of all, if system changes, uh, data which we use from the past describe systems, uh, system A. If system changes, it becomes system B, and about system B, we may not have data. Same thing, yes. But uh, when I show that neural network uses f input uh, flow uh, input, we may build neural network without flow as input as well and use purely rainfalls. No problem. And does it, but does it, if you don't do it? It would be not that accurate, of course. Yeah. Of course, neural network is accurate because it's very much autoregressive process and we pick up previous terms into this autoregressive equation. So maybe 80% of the accuracy comes from that fact. If you leave purely rainfalls, it's not uh, that accurate. That's for sure. Yes. But uh, look, uh, for climate change uh, studies, uh, interesting point. But if we uh, imagine that uh, now is uh, 100 years from now, and we know the state of environment 100 years from now, or we assume something, we can run it forward and use neural networks. Because, because we, but we, we don't, we, we are not anymore allowed to use measured instruments. Yeah, that's and true. Of course, of course. Yes. You're right. Last question. Um, could uh, these rates of uh, neural networks uh, be the real methodological parameters? As, uh, Interesting uh, point. Uh, so Bob Abrahart, uh, maybe 15 years ago, they with Linda C, they published a couple of papers and some other people. So they say some of these nodes may be uh, representing these tanks. So one node, you c they try to show that one node so uh, is responsible for representing soil moisture, which brings in input to the uh, total output flow. You know, one node is overland flow, and there is some correlation if you, but it's a bit artificial, I don't think so. It's purely mathematics. These are purely functions which are just numbered. I don't think they carry any physics in it. 
But you know, there is a, another data-driven model which is called genetic programming. In genetic programming, you uh, uh, fix a set of functions and operators, and then the random, uh, random combination of them, uh, randomized search, you find, you, you build up a formula uh, which would be accurate data-driven model, okay? Now, what first uh, propagators of this idea did, they took Kepler equations and they built uh, a formula which was exactly Kepler equ equation. So they said it's a knowledge discovery. So by random search in the space of operators and coefficients, we found Kepler's law. Okay, maybe Kepler you, you found, but I don't think you can uh, generate Darcy equations or whatever. So I, I'm a bit doubtful. But genetic programming is interesting thing. It sometimes generates very strange, crazy statistical equations of strange uh, combination of uh, variables. But if you l constrain it a bit, it may generate equations which resemble physics. But still, I don't trust this. I don't think you can discover physics, uh, uh, really accurate physical equations from limited data. On this positive note, thank you very much.